I know we don't have a board of estimates meeting, so. But it was a great first day of school. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, great first day of school. Uh, some really excited young people who started school yesterday. Uh, we went by uh, one of our new schools on yesterday. I also went by, what's the name of that school? Frederick, Frederick, Elementary. Frederick Elementary, Mary but the Rodman. Mary Rodman and the Second Chance School. Excel. 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 That's right, you were there. And yes, um, but Excel was also a great experience. What we have at Excel are young people who are getting a second chance, and they had their own little workshop uh, where they talk about why uh, they're excited about having a second chance. Uh, one young man I met had actually been shot before and said he made a decision that he really wanted to get his life together, and I thought that was really positive. But I thought I would introduce you all to uh, some people were here, uh, two, member, two new members of our staff. Frank Johnson uh, will be Baltimore City Chief of Information Officer, uh, comes to us with a great deal of experience, and we're excited. One of the things that we want to make sure, Frank, where are you? Yes, Frank. Uh, you can come up. One of the things we want to look at in terms of our whole Office of, of Information is how do we get tech, a technology platform, get everybody communicating on the same platform? As you well know, our platforms are so outdated in many of our agencies, so we're looking forward to uh, Frank being able to help us do that. He's in the process now of assessing his department and um, making sure that we coordinate. We have so, All of our agencies actually have their own uh, technology person, and we really need to get everybody on the same platform. So what I'd like to see us do is develop that triangle where everybody's reporting to one individual and we're developing a kind of platform where we're communicating across the board. So sure. welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Thank Mayor. Thank you. Any questions for Frank? Take that down. You want to come? Thank you. Born and raised in the Midwest. I have a technology background by trade. I'm an, started off as an engineer. I uh, was in the right place at the right time. I had the opportunity to go work for Intel Corporation and spent the better part of the last 25 years helping organizations transform their businesses, their capabilities, their service delivery through the use of technology. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am about the challenge and the opportunity to work with Madam Mayor to help her transform the lives of the people here in Baltimore through the use of digital technology. And I'm, today's day number two, and I can't wait to get started. Have you had a chance to um, assess at all the city's need uh, I'm starting that. So we're going to assess, baseline, modernize, and standardize, and then build a path to the future. Our vision and goal absolutely is sometime in the not-too-distant future is to put Baltimore on the same smart city map with very, very progressive cities in North America, and first and foremost, help the mayor realize the full, the fullest potential of her five-pillar plan. What are some things that those other smart cities <coughs> that you just mentioned that you think Baltimore could add? I'm sorry, say again. What are some of the, you just mentioned, you know, getting Baltimore on the map as a smart city. What are some common threads that run through these other smart cities? Uh, what the, first of all, it, it starts with leadership. Having a commitment to uh, digitally transform the capability and delivery mechanisms and therefore the lives of the citizens in the city. And, and, the, and the second thing is a very close partnership with the local higher educational institutions, the venture capitalists that are investing in tech, tech startups here in the city. Um, uh, the local businesses, and as well as the surrounding governments. So those four entities are absolutely going to be close allies and key collaborators and contributors to our vision and plan here. And you're also trying to also uh, digitalize the platforms which the city agencies run on. So you have your, you know, your claims agency, and if, you know, we as journalists are asking for claims and we <laughs> want to see something. It There's makes it much easier for them to deliver on those claims if we have some sort of automated system, is that what you're... Uh, step one is to assess what we have, chart a path to the future. Usually step two becomes standardize and modernize the systems that are here. You know, much more cloud-like, much more modern, elastic, scalable, flexible, so that we can build uh, key cap smart city-like capabilities on top of them in the future. So for like years and years, they've been saying, you know, it's the mainframe system that we rely on too much. <laughs> yes. It's broken, um, you know, the software isn't very flexible, and yet it never gets fixed. So what's going to be different in your leadership? Yeah, we're, we, I, I've successfully helped hundreds of organizations standardize and modernize their infrastructure, and we absolutely will standardize and modernize the baseline infrastructure here in the city. 
it is step one. I, I think too the commitment, uh, the commitment to do that. Um, I think I said from day one uh, that we need to get 5G ready. The city is not. Um, I've also said that we need to eliminate some of the paper usage. You all see us at the Board of Estimates. Uh, I'm using my laptop. Uh, some folks aren't yet, but uh, we want everybody to get on uh, a platform that makes sense for today's technology. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Johnson. J-O-H-I. You're coming from here from the private sector. Uh, so let me introduce to some and uh, reintroduce to others our new city solicitor that we're very excited about. Um, you all know him as a federal judge, uh, a Baltimorean, uh, but more importantly, someone who's uh, going to be taking over that office, and we're very excited to have him with us. So, Thank you, you, Madam Mayor. I'll sure. be glad to take any questions. What's even your message to, um, well, I mean, a lot of the solicitor's office work is taken out by the police department. <laughs> Absolutely. So what's been your message, to the extent you've had an opportunity to do that, what's been your message to the police department? I wrote to the commissioner uh, last week, maybe two weeks ago, in response to a note he sent me. And I'd met the commissioner before, and I assured him that I was going to work hand in glove with him to bring about the reforms that we both want. So that's my message, that um, we're going to provide the assistance from a legal and policy perspective and implement that consent decree in a way that we can all be proud of. That's the message. In the politest possible way, you have quite a good gig before. Be one. One. <laughs> 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 like, but, you know, what made you decide that you were tired of Richmond and that you wanted to be in Baltimore and do this? quite, I think, a difficult job. You know, I, I never imagined that I would leave the bench, honestly. Yeah. Um, 30 years and one month, I was a judge. And it was, frankly, the mayor's vision, coupled with my love of the city, and my feeling that I could really have an impact in the city um, with the consent decree and with the excellent law department that I've known for years. These lawyers have appeared before me in court. Uh, I know a number of them through bar associations. And it was just an opportunity that I couldn't turn my back on. Bottom line is I love the city. I care about the city. I grew up in East Baltimore, three blocks from Johns Hopkins Hospital. And, uh, and that's what I want to make my life's work going forward. What do you see as the biggest challenge or the biggest goal taking on this role? Oh, reforming the police department. I said to a community group the other day, uh, Madam Mayor, I told them, if in two or three years we haven't reformed the police department, I think the people are going to blame the mayor, but it'll be my failure as city solicitor. That's my focus. Among all the other things the city solicitor has to do, we got to reform the police department. And I know the commissioner and the command staff are committed to that, as is the mayor. Well, no, give me into this question. Where are you in the process? Are both of you together? I'm not sure. In the process of um, selecting a uh, consent decree monitor? It's going to happen in the next two weeks, probably well before that. Okay. But the, the department is very much engaged with the judge in a process, and you'll be hearing a lot about it in the next few days. Right. Is the Department of Justice and the city on the same page? I would say yes. I would on very much. On the who's going to be. Well, Decisions haven't been made yet, but, but the working relationship between DOJ and the city law department and the police department could not be better. I can, I can tell you that. The, I think the deadline is Friday that the judge gave you. After the, are you going to be asking for another extension? We're, we're going to see. We're going to see. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, you said that reforming the police department is your sort of big objective. What kind of you're presumably not going to be suing the police department any further. Like what levers do you have to pull to kind of influence them and get them to change? Well, we never sue the police department. <laughs> <laughs> the police department is our client. <laughs> uh, but when you say levers, you know, we, how are you going to influence we're them? going to implement the consent decree. Mm -hmm. Really, the consent. Of course, you've read the consent decree, and Judge Bradar is going to do everything he can with the monitor's assistance and with my office's assistance to implement every one of the recommendations in that consent decree. And we're going to do it. 
you, you um, have you had a chance to catch up on the status of the FOP negotiations since we're now like 14 months past? I, I haven't. Do you? Yeah, the, the, well, I you would. It's it's a priority to be sure, but it's a process underway, as you know. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Any questions for me? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> on, the, on the topic of your Office of Information Technology, um, the, the, the leadership there has uh, kind of rotated in and out the past couple of years, even under past administrations. Mm -hmm. um, what's it going to mean to have someone there permanently to really kind of try to take the reins of that department? Well, I think it's important because one of the things I talked about early on was, you know, getting us on a technology platform where we all are able to communicate. And at the same time, preparing for 5G. Uh, I want us to be a smart city, but it certainly begins with the kind of technology that we implement. I think that having someone like Frank Johnson with the experience in the private sector is going to make a difference as well. You know, sometimes you have to look outside in order to bring the right people inside to, to make the changes that you want. And so I'm very confident that we brought in the right person. Uh, when you say make the city 5G ready, I, I, is that's not something that the cell companies are just going to build that infrastructure? Like what does no, I just meant so that we can use all the technology that becomes available through 5G. Uh, we, we don't have those tools in place, and I think that with Frank, we'll be able to ass assess what we, our needs are so that we can be more prepared. The governor has talked about cutting the state budget, and one of the things that he's talked about is reducing the health department's budget by $22 million. How is that going to affect the city health department with the heroin um, well, one of the things that he's not um, taking back is our drug treatment dollars. And you should know that 90 percent of our state, uh, of our health department's money comes from the federal government. And um, we, we're very grant heavy, and uh, the rest of it is funded through the city. Going back to the consent decree monitor, um, is there a specific reason that there's been the need for the extensions and the delay? The I'm not aware of that. I just know that um, we've narrowed it down to, I think, four or two. Mm -hmm. And um, they're looking very, the judge was at the various hearings, um, my understanding, incognito. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think they're just going through their, their careful review. But Grudel came to the hearing, the public hearings in yeah, he was there. I don't know what incognito looks like to him, but he didn't have his judge uh, robe. uniform robe on. This is another one of these rude, but I'll try and skip to light these questions. You have a lot of quite high profile people who you've been able to get to come and work for you. Do you ever worry about being overshadowed by them, or how do you kind of manage these people who've been? very successful in their own right and now it's sort of Well, I think they they come because they want to serve the city. And I mean, even if you were to attend some of the uh, call to action meetings mm -hmm. and some of the call to action activities that I've been engaged in, I don't have to stand out in front of everything. I would just want people to do their work and to do best by the city. Uh, when uh, folks come around the table and their first interest is Baltimore City, that's my only concern. Just do your job. Mayor, have you had any um, conversation with your the city solicitor staff or anyone, even other mayors, um, on the issue of the DACA recipients? Yes. Of in fact, which there are 10,000 believed to be in Maryland and a bunch of them, I'm sure. In yeah, about 20,000 in Maryland, my understanding. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, have you had any conversation about whether you have any ability to protect these people? Um, city solicitor? Well, let me just say, um, first of all, that um, we are urging uh, Congress, first of all, uh, to do what they need to do as quickly as possible because we want to protect the individuals here in the state of Maryland and in our country. Uh, we believe that uh, we ought to be providing services. We certainly ought to be providing education uh, for these young people. And so I would hope that we would not go backwards, that we would continue to go forwards. There is an event this evening, I believe, around 730 that I will be attending in support of uh, making sure that we are supportive of these individuals. You said it very well. Is there anything that the local government can do to, um, to protect people who, are, who, who may now be at, like, almost depending on how this unfolds, but who could be at risk that they haven't been facing in the past? Certainly to continue to, to express our support for the efforts of these young people who 
deserve so much more than they've been allowed so far. Um, I'm hopeful that government at all levels will will come to to our senses about this whole thing. What about the attorneys that were put in place to assist those with immigration issues in uh, federal courts here in Baltimore? Um, is that still in place? Are, are they are they are they still working? Uh, how is that? What is the status of that? It, you know, one of the most uh, positive developments that we've seen in the last seven or eight months is the re extraordinary pro bono free legal services that that lawyers from across the spectrum, I mean, criminal law practitioners, civil law practitioners, even bankruptcy lawyers who don't have any particular expertise in immigration matters and related matters are stepping forward to provide assistance. So the answer to your question is yes. And I, and I suspect that after this week, uh, the volunteer lawyer cohort will increase significantly. People are going to step up and make sure that justice is done to these young people and their families. And are you worried down there about um, just businesses? Uh, I was talking with the State Farm Agency over in Highland Town yesterday. Um, eight of his work, half of his workers are DACA recipients. You know, they bring a great vast knowledge of being bilingual. I mean. How will this affect uh, Baltimore's economy? Well, let me just say, I think, first of all, we stand with them. I'm asking business folks to stand with them as well. Let's continue to support them, because I think that this does not just affect the economy of Baltimore. It affects the economy of the state. It'll affect the economy of the nation. I think that's the message that's being delivered today, yesterday, and will continue to be delivered to Congress, that they need to make sure that we're protecting all of these individuals every single day so that they can, again, you know, we're not talking about people who aren't, they've been productive members of our society, and we should support them at that. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.